with our radio show. So, Phil, tell us what started your journey, you know, into music. What inspired you to want to learn how to play? Well, I started up at a very early age, you know, playing, you know, I think I think the very first thing was a plastic harmonica. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people start off with a harmonica. <laughs> yeah, and I progressed with it quite a lot. I found I could get a lot of tunes out of it, so I was kind of known for playing that. And, of course, around about the age, I probably about 13 or 14 or somewhere around then, um, I got into, the, there was a big craze in England called Skiffle. And it was kind of a folk music hit, uh, where they played guitars and they basically made instruments like tea chest basses and things like that. I don't know if you ever heard of those kind of instruments. You know, it's where they put a pole of one corner of a tea chest and a piece of string to the other corner. And they basically <laughs> pull it backwards and forwards and, and bend the pole and it, it makes bass noises. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so they used to play those kind of things. And there was a whole slew of people. In fact, there was an early... By the time I was age 16, I actually was one of the first, certainly the first person out of my school, my grammar school, and, and uh, it predates the Beatles. I actually played the cavern. I was, I was um, uh, a young lad in school, and I was playing down a little. One, some of the older boys had heard me playing harmonica, and they were playing guitars by this time, and they had said, oh, could I come down to their little you know, what they call refer their little club. What it was was one of the young boys had a had a, a cellar in his house and they'd made it out like a little place where they could play music and they, they you know, they they served coffee. It was all very innocent in mm -hmm. those days. And and they you know, uh, except for the girls were out there down there eyeing the boys as they <laughs> will do it. Uh, as they will do at that age. Yeah. And of course the boys are playing guitars which the girls are attracted to. Oh look he's singing, you know. Phil, uh, Phil, where where did you grow up at? Uh, well, this is all in, in uh, close to Liverpool. Okay. It's in a town called Wallasey, and and these clubs are thing where we are in the in the town of Wallasey, in fact. And I went to Wallasey High School, which is a very very old uh, school. It was actually founded in 1494, so it was one of the oldest schools in England. It was only two years after Columbus discovered America. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, we, we, you know, I was in, but there was a group there that had been um, called a folk group, uh, founded by a gentleman called Lofty Davis, and they were, they had named themselves, they were big fans of Pete Seeger over here, I believe it is, yeah. who had a band called the Weavers, mm -hmm. and well, they called themselves the Spinners, as as a kind of, um, you know, a tribute to that, and they used to play uh, folk music, and they actually had, uh, were working in and around Liverpool, and um, they were, were able to play the Cavern, which at that time was pretty much a jazz club. And in some respects, a lot of the bands playing there were uh, Dixieland-style bands. And um, I, uh, they invited me over, and so and I went on to the stage of the Cavern, was playing harmonica with them. And lo and behold, a very uh, smart-looking man in a shiny sort of blue suit came on and looked like he was dressed for going on stage almost. And I didn't realize who he was. And the reason he got on stage was the gentleman there had a, a handmade a 12 string, which is the first time anyone had ever seen him, one in, in, in Liverpool. And I looked up at the man and realized it was Lonnie Donegan. And Lonnie Donegan was one of the very early skiffle stars. Yeah. And he was actually appearing uh, and, and had played the cavern before because he used to be a banjo player in a Dixieland band. I believe in Chris Barber's Dixieland band. Uh, but he. Um, he, in fact, had grown to a star playing skiffle, and he used to sing songs around about, in fact, the area I live now, which is Nashville. He actually uh, sang songs about the Cumberland Gap and the Rock Island Line, which is a, a, he has a railway that runs right through here to Rock Island. Uh, and so those were two of his biggest hits. And um, so he was a national star at that time in England, and... Um, there I was on the cabin playing behind him. I thought that was quite a, 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 an achievement at the time. <laughs> well, yeah, of, of course. I mean, how did you pick up the sax? Well, um, I, you know, very interested in music, and of course, I interested in the guitar. And um, my sister started going out. Who was two years old, and they started going out with a gentleman who was, in fact, had a job as the jazz critic for the Liverpool newspaper called the Liverpool Echo. 
And he um, used to invite her around, and, and he used to, I think he played drums or something or other. But anyway, the, uh, I never saw him play. But he took a little bit of interest in the fact that I was trying to learn guitar, and he bought me some jazz guitar books, which was, wasn't quite what I was trying to learn, but nevertheless, it, it gave all of the stuff I was supposed to try and you know learn. But at the same time, he supplied my sister with a load of records, jazz records, and of course, there were saxophones on it. And as I started to listen to them, I realized I really wanted to do that. <laughs> now, did, did, you know, did you teach yourself how to play the sax? Absolutely. Yeah. I, <laughs> my mother drove my mother crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I eventually fed on a very old Pan American silver saxophone, which was probably some of were vintage around the 20s or somewhere around that. And I used to go in the bathroom and play it in the bathroom because I like the echo sound. <laughs> <laughs> they say that's some of the best places to do your recordings is in the bathroom. Oh, everybody used to sing in the bathroom, in the shower, didn't they? Because of the tower, tile would make their voice sound wonderful the way it bounced off the bathroom walls, you know. So um, that's what I used to do is go in there and play the saxophone because it made sound great. But of course, my mother was always banging on the door and saying she needed to use the bathroom. <laughs> So, so what do you consider your first big break into the music scene? You know, that, that gave you the confidence you could be a career musician. Um, well, you know, it wasn't really a big confidence boost. What it was was the fact that the Beatles uh, became successful out of Liverpool, and we were all Liverpool groups, and so we got caught up with the fantasy that if they could make it, so could we. And so, you know, we did this. We wanted to do the same thing as they did, and of course there were agents and Everything was uh, growing rapidly. Uh, I mean, once the Liverpool, you know, once the Liverpool groups, the Embroni, the first ones went to Germany, next thing you know, agents in, in England were, were sending all kind of groups to, to Germany. Even the London group started going over there, you know. And so uh, we got to go over to Germany the same way the Beatles did. And, of course, on coming back, by that time, we had uh, managed to attach ourselves as a little group to um, the Animals Agency, which was um, Mike Jeffries, and uh, was later, of course, um, one of the animals himself gave up playing and became one of the managers in the uh, in that agency. And in fact, I recall when we were we were down in London and they'd fitted us up in a flat and we're paying our rent kind of because we didn't have any money. And they were trying to, you know, we'd just come back from Germany and uh, and or they were trying to get everything going, and they had a, a, a agency that we used to go into to see, you know, what was going on and had we got any work and all of that. And I saw Charles Chandler walking out with this rather disheveled-looking man in what looked like a one of those um, stage, you know, backup musician suits. I mm -hmm. call them like shiny mohair suits, <laughs> you know. And, and he had a, a kind of down-at-heel uh, pair of shoes on, and he looked kind of a bit, a bit disheveled, frankly. And his hair looked a bit nappy, and, and it was a it was a, a black gentleman, an American. And, and uh, Chaz turned to me and said, "Oh, I want you to meet this guy. He's going to be the next biggest thing." And I thought, "Really?" You know, <laughs> looking at him, and he said, "His name's Jimmy." Well, it was, <laughs> it was Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> so at that point in your career, when you started playing and recording alongside these big names, and, you know, I'm curious as to how someone handles their very first tour. You know, on the road, did you live the the rock and roll lifestyle? Oh, yeah. I mean, we lived very much a rock and roll lifestyle in Germany. And then, and then, of course, in England, it wasn't quite the same as what was starting. It's really the, the real rock and roll lifestyle that we refer back to there, today was really the second British invasion. The first British invasion was kind of fairly innocent in some respect. By the time it got to the second British invasion, a lot of all things had also happened with the young girls of then. They, the, the pill had been invented, and all of a sudden there was sexual <laughs> liberation. You know, all of a sudden you were being cacked by you know young girls who were going, "Hey, you know, I fancy you." You know, and you're going, "Oh my God, I you fancy know. you too." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that's when you got all those things, and 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 by that time, of course. You know, in the early 70s, the word groupie came around, you know. And and um, so rock and roll became particularly wild. And, of course, by the 70s, you know, as you know, with, you know, uh, the follow-on from probably the late 60s, it really happened with the Beatles were into it fairly early on. But drugs had really kicked in a lot by then. Mm -hmm. You know, psychedelic stuff, things like that, a lot of psychedelic bands and stuff well, like that. that. Well, that was normal, you know, that was normal. Uh, well, not early on it hadn't. When I went to Germany first, it was fairly rare. 
It was, mm-hmm. you know, there were one or two people that we saw. I remember Tony Shed- Sheridan, one of, you know, one of the Beatles sort of heroes at the time, walking on stage with a big cello guitar at the Star Club. And we were staggered to see that he had a pipe in which he was smoking hash in it. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, oh, my God, you know, he's way out. You know, it's like we knew of it, but it wasn't really. I mean, what was really the thing in those days? And because everybody was staying up all night, the clubs were, you know, playing. I mean, you you on the, the weeknight, you started, I think it was around about oh, six or eight o'clock and played till like four in the morning. But I mean, if you played the weekends, you played all night. You know, you didn't finish till six in the morning. Yeah, you had to have something you, to keep you awake. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. <laughs> so what we call prellies or preludins or black bombers or whatever it was that was going around, those were the sort of things people were taking at that time. And I mean, essentially, I mean, I remember one time, you know, literally staying up for three days in a row and uh, ended up, and I was going back to the hotel and I was just in the hotel changing my pants and putting a fresh shirt on to go out again. And I remember looking at the bed and I woke up 19 hours later. <laughs> well, how's, how's that affect your playing after, uh, you know, being awake? I don't know. Two? I missed the first set the following night. <laughs> <laughs> I was out cold. <laughs> there was no getting you up. Well, I mean, you know, uh, most of the time speed is pretty reasonable for playing as long as you don't overdo it. You have to be a fast thinker on stage anyway. And if you're burning up energy, and young people do, they've got a lot of energy. You know, it wasn't really too bad. I imagine it's a lot better, uh, worse when you're older and you're, you know, you're probably a little more jaded or a little more exhausted. You can't, recoup, you can't recoup as much. Well, you're trying to give yourself energy you don't really have, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, when youngsters bounce back quick, you know, they do. You know, later on, it takes you several days to bounce back, you know. <laughs> and some people don't bounce back at all, oh, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. You know? But, you know, it was a wild life, and we were sort of groups. Now, once we came to England... And we were touring. By that time, I wasn't really in a band so much anymore. We were we were for a while. We formed. Uh, we ended up at one point amalgamating two bands together, and we called ourselves this and that. And there was an American gentleman who couldn't really sing. He was actually fact, he was a bit of a showman. His name was Freddie Mac, and he had. Uh, we were called the Mac, uh, Freddie Max of this and that. It later reincarnated for a thing called Freddie Max, the, the Max Sound. Mm-hmm. And that played in England for quite a long time. And what it was, a whole host of, um, you know, would-be um, R&B singers and basically a soul band, you know, using the, the standard sort of, uh, you know, Hammond organ, uh, mm-hmm. guitar, bass, drums, probably a set of congas and, and a brass section, usually about four or five brass guys. You know, mm-hmm. and we would be playing what they was called the Stax Volt sound, and you know the the Philly sound and the Motown sound, playing all that kind of stuff. That really happened in the '60s, you know, the later '60s, uh, and you know that was what kept the horn players going, you know, really, because by that time it was a fight on one side to be a three guitar group like the Beatles, or to be you know a soul band and, and play that kind of stuff. So we we toured around doing that for quite a while. But those tours were pretty organized and fairly, uh, they weren't in the same way. It wasn't until you got, you know, the long-haired, wild-looking rockers, you know, that were almost to the point of, the, you know, which eventually was going to produce glam rock, was, was in the 70s, really, mm-hmm. you know, with Led Zeppelin and people like that. You know, that's when that heavy, and that's when the groupy thing really kicked in heavy. You know, you've worked with so many artists and bands, yeah. you know, I can't cover them all. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the bands you know that I'm I'm partial to. Uh, you know, okay. I, want to, I want to start off with the Eagles because you know they're one of the top bands of all time. How did you come to work with them? Well, it's a long story. Really, what happened was I was playing with Al Stewart, and I was doing you know recording over there. And one of the gentlemen who was on the road band with Al Stewart was a gentleman called Steve Chapman, who ended up as his manager now. But at that time, Steve was the drummer, and there was an ex bass player who had played with Al who was Charlie Harrison. They both kind of left Al when you know, Al came off the road and needed some work. And they uh, right uh, at that moment in time, um, Steve, Timmy Schmidt had left, suddenly been offered and leaping up and down saying, God, I'm a millionaire, because he suddenly got a, a phone call saying, would you ju- come along and join the Eagles? So the Eagles had now stolen two of Poco's bass players. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Poco was getting a bit tired of this. Yeah. And by that time, Richie Ferre had lost his, his hope in the band. And I think George Grantham, 
who had been the drummer, also lost it, and they left. And Poco was struggling. It was at the last end of its of its uh, um, recording contract, and they knew they had one more album to go, and the record label would probably drop them because there was only two of them left. Uh, Rit, uh, sorry, uh, Rusty Young, who by that time was now owning the name, because the other one, even um, Paul Cotton, was kind of an add-on from when you know Richie left. You know, and so they, they were down to really one member and, 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 and one added on guitar player, you know, and, and the two of them felt that this was like they better put a band together and just make the last album, you know. Mm-hmm. And they had never succeeded in making more than 250,000 sales. Anyway, at that point in time, Charlie and Steve knew of me. They produced Heart of the Night. They called me in to play Heart of the Night, and bang, the record went through the roof. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, it was the, the biggest record. You know, it's, a, it's kind of ironic that Poco, who had been, you know, over Float Springfield and all of these, you know, people, and, and uh, Messina, what was it, Jim Messina, and uh, it had been um, Randy Mize, and all these names, you know, and well, have you had Jimmy Schmidt for years, all of a sudden, couldn't make it anymore, and along come three English guys. <laughs> and it goes boom through the roof. One more American. He had Kim Bullard as a great keyboard player. But, you know, uh, basically, there was me, <laughs> me, and Charlie Harrison and Steve Chapman. That was like uh, what went in and play, we played Heart of the Night. And, of course, Rusty had also written um, a very catchy little thing of um, Crazy Love. So those two singles banged the thing through uh, into the million sales. All of a sudden, Poco was alive and well and kicking. <laughs> well, looking back over his shoulder, Timmy Schmidt goes, "What the hell?" <laughs> you know, and who is and who is that sax player? <laughs> they had never had a thing. So when David Tambor got sick, Timmy Schmidt said, "Let me call this guy." You know, so they had auditions for all of the L.A. top guys who were just dying to, you know, have the gig with the Eagles, who wouldn't? They were the most, the world's most popular band that year. You know, and I went down there and the floor was literally littered with reeds on the floor where, you know, these, uh, you know, sax players were just, you know, working themselves to death trying to get this gig. And they looked at me and just said, okay, play it, I'll play it. And they went, okay, come next door. <laughs> and they took us next door and said, well, what do you want to drink? I thought, I've got this gig. <laughs> You know, and they, I said, a Scots, and they said, they looked at me like this early in the afternoon, and I thought, oh, God, who are you guys with rock and roll? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they offered me money right there, and then I got the gig, you know, so that's, I, I'm pretty sure it was from Tippy Smith looking over his shoulder, because I didn't know anybody in the Eagles. It had to be, you know? Now, are you the type of person who gets starstruck when meeting performers like that for the first time? You know, even though musically you're on the same level as them, but, you know, just being a fan of music, how rewarding was it to, to meet these type of people and being able to play with them? Well, I don't, you know, you know, funny enough, I don't tend to get so starstruck on players. I kind of, it's almost like, you you know, you're a pro tennis player or somebody's another pro tennis player and you think, oh, they're pretty good. Let's just see how good they are. You know, mm-hmm. it's one of those. Uh, because I tell you, what, my experience has always been there's what I, we used to refer to in Liverpool as dressing room heroes. You know, in other words, like the, you, they, you could hear them practicing on uh, backstage, mm-hmm. and uh, you go, "Oh my God, listen to this guy! I better be good at tonight. Look, he's killing it. Listen to him, you know." And, and then he goes out, and he starts playing thing, and you put him on a spot for a song, and nothing happens. You know, and you go, oh, I see it. He's great in the dressing room, but when he put him on <laughs> uh, on the stage, he can't. You know, he, he his bottle goes, as it were. You know, so I mean, I just been known for being able to get out on the stage. One of the reasons I think is because early on in my career, before I left school, I I took on acting. Okay. You know, okay. I took on acting at school, and I think it gives you the confidence to stand in front of an audience. You know, if you can stand in front of an audience without a saxophone, <laughs> you know, then you're so much better when you've got a saxophone. <laughs> did, did you have that problem at the beginning of your career, or maybe even still now? Do you get jitters before going I, on stage? I had it first on when, when I jumped on stage. It kind of threw me a bit. You know, cause the first time I was playing with the, 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 the group, the press man, and they just said, oh, come along and, you know, join in. And I said, well, they don't even know the tune. That doesn't matter. I, I can make it up as I go along. You know, I'm very good at winging it. Mm-hmm. And um, they were playing on the cabin, and I, I had this really colorful shirt that I put on the, that I really liked that my mother had actually made for me. So I put this shirt on, so I looked like you know, rather flashy in this shirt. And I was very, very young. 
And they said, they, I was standing in the dressing room, and they were already on, you know, when I got in, they, they said, oh, stay back for a bit, and we'll tell you when to come on. So I'm standing there. At one point, they turned around and went, okay, come on. So I, I had to, I was to realize that there was like a little, big, little bit of a wall and an amphitheater from me, so I really had to jump over it. <laughs> so I just, being young, I just jumped over it right into the middle of the stage, and three girls went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I just screamed, I thought, oh my God, what did I do? You know, it's like, <laughs> and I realized that's what girls did. <laughs> you know, for a the moment there, I was really thrown. There's nothing know? wrong with having girls scream at you. No, no, but you know, when you're not expecting it, it's kind of weird. <laughs> I was young, I said, no, I'd never had girls scream at me. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, I was like, oh dear, oh great, you know. In fact, recently it was very funny because I got um, I, I I played this as you know the Albert Hall oh, in, yeah. in London, mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful gig. What a place to play! It's like one of those vintage opera houses with just great boxes going up for as far as the eye can see, you know, and uh, a huge, great circular thing on it. In fact, I think I've got a. Uh, the guy took me out on the sound check and took a photograph behind me showing all the, you know, the, the great circle of, of boxes and all the lights that light them up, you know, um, and it looks amazing from the stage. And he took a picture of me from that side with my sack held in the air, so I can't wait to see the shot. It's coming over pretty soon. Anyway, you know, um, uh, because I was playing the Albert Hall and I, I put it out that was going there, um, Several of my friends just suddenly found me on, on Facebook, said, oh, my God, we've got to be there. And these were the guys I had not seen since the days of the press men. Oh, you know, wow. I'd literally not seen, seen this guy since night in Germany in a club in Flensburg in 1964. That was the last time I saw him. <laughs> so um, they both showed up. You know, he, he and another drumming friend that they've been, they both showed up. And he said, oh, look what I got for you. And he pulled out a huge picture of the press men on the cavern in 1961. <laughs> oh, well, that had to be neat. Oh, it was he said, not only that, he said, but I tell you what, you know who was on right after we were playing this thing? And I said, no. He said, you'll see, because there's a picture of them with the same background behind them. I said, who? I said, the Beatles. <laughs> that's a pretty cool, uh, that's a pretty cool but, gig to be opening up for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, we were, you know, uh, that was kind of the thing at the time. It was, uh, so there we were, Sherry's Day. So I literally was able to say after that kick, because I remember them coming coming on as we were coming off or whatever it is, and uh, I literally said, yeah, old Paul McCartney sweated on me. <laughs> <laughs> you could sell he, that on he, eBay. He dripped on me, you know. <laughs> dripped on me. <laughs> as I was climbing in, you had to, both had to climb in and out on that hole. Cabin was one, you know, uh, more than one hole. It was, it was a, a great tunnel sort of affair, underground tunnels, you know. That's really what it was. It was arches all the way down. Now, was they that built in, in bricks in those days. Yeah, was, was that the first time you had played there? Oh, no, no. I, like I say, I'd played there before, even before the, the the rock groups ever played the cavern. I'd played there as a 16-year-old. Well, I was talking about the Royal Albert Hall. Oh, the Royal Albert, yeah, absolutely, for the first time. You know, and that was... Um, uh, that was why I was so, you know, thrilled to get the gig and go and go out there. It was wonderful. You know, and to get a standing ovation, that was just ice cream. You know, that was icing on the cake right there. Yeah, you know, as far, was, as, far as stacking up to other venues you've performed at, you know, where does it stand? You know, acoustically, the environment, you know, or just the overall coolness factor of being able to play at a, at a venue like that? Well, just being able to play it, for one, because, A, it's a very much a, a part of the British institution. Because it's, it is the Royal Albert Hall. And if you look along right next door is the Royal uh, Art College and the Royal this and that and the other. And right over the road is the Kensington uh, Palace where, you know, all the royal stay, such as, you know, in the past, Princess Margaret, Diana, you know, is right over the road. You're only, uh, uh, you know, to, to, that's to the left if you look at the map. And to the right is, you know, you're backing on to Buckingham Palace. I mean, it's a very, very, you know, that's why it is, because it's kind of the hall that was built there so that Vic Queen Victoria and people like that, because Albert, of course, was her regent. That was her husband. Mm -hmm. You know, it was built, I guess, for him or by him, you know, because uh, it's the Royal Albert Hall. And so that the Victorian hierarchy of that time, which, you know, at the time was probably the creme de la creme of the powerful in the world in the Victorian period. And you're, and you're yeah. right across the road and you're, and you're just jamming yeah. out doing your thing. 
<laughs> yeah, and then that, that's where, so it was, you know, the, the Queen could just literally get in her carriage and just trot down to the Albert Hall to watch whatever artist she wished, she re, you know, she requested to be on there, you know. <laughs> it was, um, uh, and, and also the other royals could come from the other direction, you know. So it was very much a royal venue in that sense, you know. So, um, you know, to play there is it, it, a very special thing, you know. I remember seeing... Adele, and she has to be one of the premier artists in the world with an Oscar to her credit and everything else, not to mention how many Grammys and what have you. And she was on the Royal Albert Hall and said, Ooh, look at me on the Albert Hall. <laughs> <laughs> she was like thrilled to be there. So I mean, I, I, I know what she feels like. I felt exactly the same myself. You know, it, who knows, you know, the, the, the wonders that have trod the, the, the boards of that hall, you know. Including many of the rock greats, of course, you know, yeah, Eric, yeah, Eric Clapton, and that's where they put all the rock greats together when they did a tribute to, um, you know, George Harrison, of course, which is, um, and they were playing many of the songs that I played on his album. You know, I wish I could have been there on that one. Oh yeah, but you, you know, but you got there. You know, I want to talk real quick before we get off here about your solo on on Year of the Cat with Al Stewart. You know, it's one okay. of, it's one of those solos that's included in everyone's list as you know the. Possibly, you know, in the top ten greatest sax solos of all time. Oh, it was voted number three on one chart. Well, well there you go. It all depends on who's doing the list. I've seen you at number exactly. one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, how long did well, it take? How long did it take you to come up with with that solo? Well, it's uh, you know a very. If I can be real quick about this, I'll tell you the magic. I've told it before, but I'll tell it again because it is the magic sax story. I had been playing in London for some time, always wanted to go to America, always hearing all the stories about rock and roll, the period we talked about, you know, all the girls, all the groupies, all the wild goings-on, the parties, you name it, you know, and all the stars involved. And I just wasn't getting to go. You know, it just wasn't going to happen. And I was making a lot of money because I was playing in another famous show that has now become probably the world's most longest-running cult movie of all time, musical, is the Rocky Horror Show. And... Um, I was playing in in the stage show in the West End. You know, wow. eventually I would play the the uh, you know the movie as well. And uh, I'd already made the movie by this time, and that was going out as well. And still, no calls to tour America. So I was just having to listen to all the the road stories from all the greats coming back and go, hmm, when am I ever going to do this? Well, I went down on the Sunday on my day off down to Surrey where my a uh, second tenor guy that I put in where all the horn section worked with me, uh, a guy called Jeff Driscoll. And I looked around in that area all day. And at the end of the day, around 5.30, we'd finished watching. I was tired, wanted to go home, wanted to watch the Sunday night movie. And um, just as we're leaving the the uh, realtors, uh, the guy is putting up a little picture of a house they've just listed. And my wife turns to it and goes, oh, look at this, let's go see it. I went, oh, Really? And she said, uh, yeah, let's go. Well, as it turned out, I was resistant. I didn't want to go see it, but I did. And we found it, and it was great. And when it was the house we were going to buy, and in fact, we did buy it. However, that triggered my saying, well, let's run over to Jeff's house and tell him we're going to be neighbors, and we found the place. So we run over there, and as I'm talking to him, he says, I've had some luck, too. I said, what's that? He said, well, there's this woman who was married you know, to a woman that had a tragic death of her husband who was a saxophone player mm. and they were so in love she's kept his saxophone under the bed all these years and has never parted with it and would not part with it and uh, now she's old and it was 1976 now and he died in like 19 late 1930s sometime and uh, 1937 he said it turned out that was slightly wrong but nevertheless very close and um he said i got it i've managed to buy it from her because she said it's silly somebody should get the benefit from it and i was you know i've got it here and i went well i don't play alto i don't even like alto you know, i'm a tenor player but i said well let's have a look so i still looked at it and it's a beautiful silver french balance section selma alto saxophone and it's in gorgeous condition like it's been in a time capsule and i said to him well that looks pretty nice I, I wouldn't mind playing that sometime and he says well i'm not using it why don't you borrow it I said, sure, okay. I put it in the thing, put it in the car. We jumped in the car and went roaring off to North London, thinking about our house we're going to buy. I get there at 5 to 8 at night. I'm sitting, uh, just ready to watch the 8 o'clock movie. The phone goes, it's Alan Parsons. Mm. I worked with him for, it was no big surprise. And I said, Alan, 
Uh, he said, he said, I've got a session for you. I said, oh, great, what day? And he went, no, now. And I went, <laughs> oh. I went, oh, you know. <laughs> right now? <laughs> yeah, right now. And he goes, you know, and I said, well, I think, I, what time And I talked to you? The movie's about an hour long. I tell you what, where are you? And he said, yeah, my Abbey Road. I went, that's five minutes away around the corner. I said, um, I could be there in an hour. And he goes, oh, hang on a minute. I thought, oh, God, I've blown it. There goes the session. <laughs> uh, and he comes back on and he goes, uh, yeah, I think that'll be okay. I said, oh, great. Put it down. I'm going to watch the movie. So I watched the movie. This is how resistant I am to my own life-changing events. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And at 9 o'clock, I run down there, walk in there. There's a low-lighting thing. There's a man holding a new, you know, figure holding a newspaper in the corner. Where I just see a pair of hands on the top of a head. He's not even looking up. And Al, Alan's sitting by the desk. He said, oh, here's this song. He plays it. Beautiful. No vocal on it. Gorgeous track. Violins, everything. Guitar solos, everything. I said, oh, this sounds amazing. He said, now where the second guitar solo is, I want you to play right here. There's right in this gap. He said, and we'll have you play out on the end. I think it'll sound great on alto. I said, Alan, I don't play alto. He says, you don't. I said, no, I'm a tenor player. And he goes, oh. I said, well, you know, I think I've got one in the car. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're pretty good at winging it. <laughs> yeah. So I had to get the sax out. I'm going, I've never played this thing before in my life. There was this guy, I didn't even know there was a mouthpiece in there I could play with. There was a reed. If it was, it was a 1930s reed. You know? <laughs> anyway, put it together, put the reed on. I went, you know, this is, I could play this. So, okay, I put it together. I said, okay, Alan, let's go. Boom. And you know, the solo just came out of the air at me. It's just like one of those situations. I think but Paul McCartney's talk about that, where music just comes out of the air at you. you know? Well, that is a great story. It just and came out of the air. Anyway, I played it. You know, I played out on the end. I was out of the door. I think, you know, I always say Alan called me in the studio and gave the greatest praise he's ever known to give. He said, yeah, I think that will do. <laughs> <laughs> and the newspaper came down and said, and said saw the top of my nose, and they said, yeah, it's very good. And after that, I got, I got a, a check, and I was out of the door. And I gave that sax back. I had never, until this Albert Hall story, never seen it again. Wow. You know, and literally... I went over to my friend Jeff's place, and he came to the album, and he, and he took me back to his place down in Surrey, and there was the saxophone sitting on the ear, uh, sitting on the mantel shelf. And I had never, and now of course it looks all old and brown and dirty and all that, you know, because he plays the heck out of it yeah. for, for 37 years. But 37 years since I saw it last, you know, A ma and, and the magic sax. So isn't that the strange story? Is that you, <laughs> you are going to America, you will need a saxophone. Uh, and it will be an alto, and I've had one put by for you, and it's sitting under the bed for, since two years before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, I mean, that's a great story. It's like it was destined. You know, it was destiny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Destiny, mm -hmm. that, exactly that. So that's how the Year of the Cat came about, just like that. So, Phil, outside of music, man, what do you do to entertain yourself? You know, you got hobbies, TV shows, anything like that? Uh, you know, I really don't. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm a fix-it guy. I love fixing things. And, of course, I've got a big house, so I, I, I'm always doing things, you know, and, uh, you know, painting walls or whatever it is that needs doing and stuff like that. I guess my biggest thing is I love music so much that I have a recording studio. And so I, I go down there and I start, you know, making records, and I bring other people in and produce records on them. I like engineering. I really do. It's kind of the magic for me. One of the things that's bad about music is, uh, from a point of a musician's point of view, is that when you're young, when I listen to records, they were absolute magic. I listen, I never knew how they were done. So the downside is, when you get to be a musician, you learn the trick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know how it's done. You know, it's just like you being on radio. You probably listened to radio when you were young and thought, oh, isn't that magic? How does that work? And then you get the other side of the coin. You can know how it works. Yeah. You kind of have to start creating your own magic. It's you know? just another day at work for you. Exactly. But by the same token, you know, you can be creative like you're being now. You're doing an interview. That's creating a whole show, isn't it? Oh, you yeah, know? yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, it's just, it's fun. It's, it's never the same thing. There's always a surprise around the corner. There's always something new and something, a new song somebody's just written something they want you to play. And even when you play the same thing on stage, when you go on, you know, it's never the same every night. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about acting, too. It doesn't matter how well you know your words, you know, you know your lines. You go out there another night, and the audience feels totally different. Your acting friends are responding differently. And so the whole night feels different. 
it, it, it just isn't the same, you know. But you do know the trick. Do you <laughs> yeah. do social media or anything like that? Do you have any websites or anything like that where people can go check out info about you or get the latest dirt or anything like I'm that? Just, I'm just getting around to that now. I've been, I've been, um, you know, uh, uh, a long life to attach me. You know, because I, I, I retired for a long time because. In, in a way, I, I put away music because my wife and I had a daughter, and I, I missed, I, you know, I was sort of, um, I didn't have parents very much when I was growing up. My father disappeared when I was three, and so I would determine when I got married, and I, if I had a child, and we took a long time to have one, it, we, we had a lot of difficulty with fertility and all that, mm-hmm. and eventually we were lucky enough to have a beautiful baby daughter. I just was not going to miss her childhood. I was just not going to be an absent dad on the road, mm-hmm. you know. So I, I more or less retired from music, and I just did my my recording studio, and I didn't go out and play very much, you know. Not uh, I, in other words, I allowed my career basically to take a back seat. And um, but now I'm coming out again. Um, you know, she's grown, and I still love her dearly, uh, obviously. And but she's a grown up girly now. And uh, I'm I'm thrilled to be going out on the on the road again, and thrilled to be working again. And uh, I've got a wonderful manager, Kim Riley, who is a seaside management, and she's now put a web page up on me. So at last, I am getting web pages and stuff. There yep. is a there is a web page going out on me, um, and uh, we're em- at the embryonic stage right now. I'm putting out a new album called A Night with the Cat, which is um, actually a instrumental interpretation of the words of Year of the Cat. Okay, well, that's, that's going to uh, be neat. Yeah, because uh, what I'd done, I'd sort of formed this album, and I'd made it like a, a, a everybody said, you're such a sexy player, that I said, well, then we'll make it some kind of um, um, album where it, it's it, it, the theme of it. I like the idea of a theme. Is a girl meets boy, they get together, and then they end up attracted, and they run away and have, you know, a, a heck of a night of sex or whatever, or romance. And then there's the aftermath and the afterglow and the final, you know, the realization and the love affair has just started, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I suddenly looked at Year of the Cat and realized that's exactly what that is. <laughs> it, it's a fantasy where a man meets a woman and goes away and has phenomenal sex and, you know, um, uh, have a romantic evening together. So that's exactly... Um, what I uh, named some of the titles. So, for instance, the first one. You, if you're familiar some with some of the words of Year of the Cat, the uh, the first one, things, the words you hear is silk dress. So that's the first thing. The second one is called um, watercolor, mm-hmm. and and then there's a, a track called incense and patchouli, and so on. So there's you know there's uh, there's even one called a brand new day. You know, which is uh, at the end of the. Um, at the end of the word, the end of the song itself. So, you know, the, the titles all lead you through a, uh, an instrumental version of the, of the lyrics, you know. So when is, that, how, when is that going to be out? It's, it's uh, I've just got the artwork and everything done. I've sent some down to the manager, so we just got to figure out how we're going to market it and everything like that. I did have them on sale at the Albert Hall, and a few copies were sold there, you know. So it's just beginning now. My art, my, my daughter did all the artwork for the, for the cover, and it, it's gorgeous. Oh, well, that's got to be neat to have your daughter working with you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, uh, she's done a fabulous job, and it's the first CD cover that she's done, but a natural, wonderful artist, you know, and she's done a great job on it. Well, Phil, man, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to join us on the show. It's been our pleasure. I mean, I loved hearing your stories. I mean, uh, you, you've been around the world, and it uh, seems like you're about to do it again. Oh, yeah. I've been around the world with, with a lot of artists. You know, I'm, I, I have fun on the road. I enjoy it because I love to play. I absolutely do. And it was an absolute pleasure doing this interview with you. It's terrific. <laughs> Radio Show.